Well, it says go, but whether it's a go is anybody's guess. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. <laughs> I do believe that we are live. As you can see, those of you who know me, I'm st <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm still in New York. I'm still coughing and spluttering a bit. It's so cold here. It's 15 degrees. I know in Vermont, it's even colder still. Uh, before we begin, first of all, I'd like to say good morning to my spirit guide, Reagan, who is standing to my right side. Uh, I'm chuckling away because Chris and I have just been having a conversation about some stuff and it's made me uh, smile. Um, <clears throat> talking of Chris, good morning, Chris. How are you? Good morning, Rosemary. I'm well. Good morning, everyone. And what, Chris? I mean, I'm complaining about 15 degrees. Give us an update on Vermont, would you? <laughs> Uh, it's showing minus six Fahrenheit on the thermometer, Ooh. Ooh. and the wind chill last I looked was a minus 26. Ah, it's cold, 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 cold. Well, here in New York, it is supposed to snow tomorrow, which means that my grandson is so excited. It's like he's been waiting for snow. He has Santa Claus for snow. He did get it in a couple of different ways, but not really a good heavy snow, and that's what he wants. I was hoping that it wouldn't snow until after I left New York. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so um, <clears throat> so uh, Chris, uh, is there anybody there? Well, there quickly. I'm seeing the numbers shoot up really quick, so I think they're still logging on. Okay. All right. Well, we won't do anything until... We won't do anything for a few minutes. We'll give people more of a chance to log on. <coughs> excuse me. So please excuse my coughing, my spluttering, my whatever's going on here. And, uh, and my sniffling as well. <laughs> because, oh dear me, I can't do cold well at all. You can see why I moved to Florida, people, can't you? Hate, hate, hate the cold. I don't even like it for five minutes. You know, people say... Oh, I love to go ice skating or I love to go skiing. Not me. <clears throat> My idea of a good skiing trip is <laughs> sitting inside at the bar with a brandy or a vodka or some something similar. And I can watch all the skiers on the slopes outside. You know how you could do that. Many ski resorts have that. And... <clears throat> That is, and then having a really, really good ham and pea soup for lunch. Yes, I can just about manage that. But the trip from there to the car and then from the car to the house, I know I'm a baby. I know everybody. I am a pampered little baby. I hate, hate, hate the gold. So there we have it. <clears throat> I can remember when I was a kid, when I was like in my teenage years and in my sort of teenage and sort of he heading up there into my 20s, um, when uh, the weather would be so cold, and of course in England we didn't wrap up for the cold weather as they do in Vermont or as they do in more serious, seriously cold climates, but, <clears throat> excuse me, have you ever heard of chillblains, Chris? <clears throat> I do feel like I've heard that word, but I have no idea what it means. Well, uh, uh, chillblains are what we used to get when we were kids. And uh, and I remember uh, as a teenager getting chillblains. Um, they are these awful, awful, seriously painful little um, sort of burn marks. Usually you get them on the backs, back of your legs. And um, <clears throat> we had a... A, a great remedy. I never tried it personally, but we had a, a, a great remedy. Uh, that it, apparently, if you if you uh, doused your chillblains with your own pee, with your own <laughs> urine, apparently that. And, and actually, I think it might work because I, th I think what happens is that it toughens your skin up. It helps to harden or toughen the skin or toughen the sores up, so that they're not quite as uh, as um, painful. But I remember, you never hear anyone anymore talking about chillblains or getting chillblains, but I remember as a kid <coughs> that we used to suffer them sort of on a, in, through the winter time on a fairly regular, every few, two or three weeks or something, one of us or some of us would have chillblains. Anyway, 
and they were so dreadfully, dreadfully painful. So I think, you know, my hatred, not quite, but you know what I mean, my, ugh, my dislike of the cold weather often probably stems from when I was a kid getting chillblains and there seemed to be no cure for it and no relief for it. I'm sure they probably have loads of things now that you could put. I'm thinking perhaps you could put aloe on now. But fortunately for me, I don't ever have to go anywhere where I might even suffer such a thing. <coughs> All right, Chris. So um, I do have, it is Saturday morning. It is the, did you say it's the 15th today? I did. Uh, I do. It is Saturday morning. It is the fifteenth of January. I do have a story for for us, but before I begin the story, uh, do we have any comments or anybody wanting anything uh, in the chat room? Well, I think because we were talking about cold weather, everyone's agreeing with you by staying by the fireplace <laughs> indoors. Um, Claire is up in uh, Canada. She's saying they've got a minus thirty-two <laughs> right now. <laughs> Claire, you poor girl. Hot chocolate. Marshmallows, hot chocolate, or even better, a hot toddy. Uh, <coughs> in my cookbook, there's a recipe for hot toddy that my father used to make occasionally for us when we were kids. Well, actually, not when we were kids. We were probably teenagers. And uh, it, was a rare, it was a rare thing for him to give us hot toddies, but... Uh, I do have that recipe, and as I said, it's in it's in my cookbook. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, sipping on a hot toddy is the best ever. Is that Great. the one that you did in your cooking show here? I don't know, three four months ago, maybe. Um, I'm not sure because there are a few different recipes that I have for hot toddy. But my <coughs> excuse me, my father's hot toddy used to have a pinch of pickling spices in in yeah that's what you made you uh, you've got it on video how to do it i do you do it, on the on my cooking channel so there yeah. you are every, look hey actually it, that it, was it, may remember when we went on that big streak of doing all kinds of things for celebration of the I, eagle and the rose i, I do but you yeah see, now it's winter time and you could actually you could use either brandy or whiskey brown sugar a good pinch of pickling spices. Do not get ground spices. It's not the same. You need the pickling spices, usually in their pods or they're like in their seeds, and you pour boiling water over and it pops, it pops them open. Uh, and my father used to swear by pickling spices in his hot toddy because he, he believed that uh, I'm listening. Um, as, you, as I'm talking to him, I am actually can see my... My daddy's standing right in front of me and he's nodding away. He still believes that pickling spices really help with colds and snuffles and uh, and, and all the rest of it. So <clears throat> brown sugar, pickling spices and um, whiskey or, or uh, brandy uh, is good. And um, yeah. Nice. <clears throat> and well, of when... course, topped with hot water. Right. I can remember you really savoring it and the smell and your father being in the kitchen there with you. So if people want to go back to that video. It is um, really, it's a delicious drink, but don't do what my daughter did. When my daughter was probably about, I'm going to say about 10 years old, right? She had the, <coughs> excuse me, she had the worst and the heaviest cold. And you could see that she just felt really, really miserable. And I wrapped her up in a big, warm, woolly dressing gown, and put her in a chair and put blankets over. And I made her a hot toddy. I, I made it sort of um, not quite as potent as I would have it, but I made her a hot toddy. And I said, I want you to, I said to, now I want you to sip on this really, really slowly. And I said, I'm just going into the kitchen for a minute or two and I'll be right back out. OK, but sip it slowly. <laughs> I'd barely got to the kitchen and she she called mama can I have another one of these <laughs> and she'd tasted it she'd drunk it down because it made her feel so good so I made her a little lighter one not so heavy on the alcohol um, 
I made her another one and then I stood over her while she sipped it slowly. But I tell you, it got her through that horrible time. She felt great. Uh, we sat together watching some sort of a movie or another and part way through she fell asleep. When she woke up the next morning, she was fine. So you see, hot toddies can be <laughs> that little miracle cure. But do, if you're going to give it to your kids, <clears throat> do not use too much of the alcohol and do do make sure that you stand over them and they don't slug it down as my daughter did. Uh, so anyway, well, all right. So Two more things, Rosemary. Yes. Um, Claire's saying maybe that drink would help you with your cough. Yes, that's what my father's actually saying to me, Claire. You're both on, this <coughs> You're both on the same page there, yeah. And then today is Jeanette's birthday. She's saying, my gift is spending it listening to you. Happy birthday to you, Jeanette. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, my darling Jeanette. Have a lovely, wonderful day. Happy birthday to you. There you are, you see, and not a cough in sight. Right, <coughs> she says. <coughs> it's actually my cough for anybody thinking, what is going on with Rosemary? It's only... It only gets worse if I talk a lot. Of course, we're talking right now. So anyway. All right. So, uh, Chris, um, anything else? No, if... we, are, we are sitting with bated breath for your story. <laughs> for our story. All right, then. Here we go. So once upon a time, um, we have to go back a long way for this. When I was young and pretty and all of that stuff. We all remember those days. So <laughs> Some of us perhaps still are young and pretty. But anyway, we go back a long way to a time when I was learning about mediumship. And um, I was lucky because, uh, you know, I had so much help and so much guidance, good help and good guidance from people who knew what they were doing, what they were about, and people who could help me, steer me, and guide me uh, in this <coughs> endeavor. I didn't uh, train to be a medium, or, although when I say that, I didn't train in perhaps what some might consider perhaps the usual way. Um, <coughs> my training had begun before I was even born to this earth, and so my training was all of those things that happened when I was a kid, all of the experience that, experiences that I had when I was a kid, and learning what those experiences meant and learning how to deal with the gift that I had. <coughs> now, I was introduced to a wonderful guy, Paul Denham, who was a healer himself. He'd been a spiritual healer for over 30 years. So you could say that he was in some ways my mentor, although he didn't actually, when you think of a mentor, you think of someone who teaches you. He didn't teach me, he just watched everything unfold and was able to explain many of the things that were happening to me, which was wonderful. <coughs> I also had another lovely guy, Mick McGuire, who, had been the president of the Spiritualist Church in Doncaster, in the, in the city of uh, yeah, the city of Doncaster, in England, uh, and so um, he had been president of the Spiritualist Church for about five years. So he knew what he was doing. He was also a healer, and um, <coughs> he knew a lot about the subject. Again, they didn't teach me because. Um, when you are a natural medium, these things just, they unfold. And it was, it was a little bit like, um, I'm going to say, you know, if you can imagine shaking a champagne bottle and, and, and imagine that I'm the champagne bottle, right? You shake and shake and shake and shake and then you pop the cork and whoosh, everything comes out. <clears throat> so everything that you need and everything that you need to make the champagne good and taste good is already there. It's already inside you. We just have to uh, allow it expression. Um, but through Mick and uh, Mick McGuire and through Paul Denham, um, they were able to give me a sense of um, <clears throat> rightness, a sense of, um, of uh, you know, 
being sane and sensible with what we had, uh, they were able to um, help me uh, as, as I described the things that I was seeing or feeling. And they were able to put into perspective many of the things that I was experiencing in that time, which was tremendously helpful to me. And through them and through the group that we had, which were some wonderful people in, in our group, um, there came this sense of um, responsibility. There came a sense of knowing the rareness of what was happening. Um, Chris and I were talking about this um, this morning. Um, you know, when I, when I or anybody else talks about the rarity of good mediumship, um, <clears throat> I know there are lots of people who think that we're talking about the rarity of good mediumship because for some reason or another, we want to keep it to ourselves or we want people to think that it's we who are special. And being a medium and being... Um, being a medium who has a rare and incredible and a beautiful gift. Um, it's not that we don't want to share, it's that we don't want to see the rarity abused. We don't want to see people go along the wrong path. Um, so when I talk about the rarity of mediumship, I'm sort of putting it into perspective. I said to, to Chris this morning, of, all of the population in the world, <clears throat> how many really, really professional and experienced heart surgeons do you think that there are? And Chris, I think you said 1%, less than, probably less than 1%. When you put it into perspective like that, it makes perfect sense. And nobody's saying, oh, that don't be ridiculous, anybody can be a heart surgeon. Um, when we talk about mediumship and we talk about the rarity of mediumship, I'm going to say that probably we have a, a similar, maybe less than 1% of the world population has this gift, which is, it's a rarity. And we should treat it as if it's a rarity. And we should treat it responsibly. I understand why people would think that they want to be mediums. Oh boy, do I ever understand why people think that they would want to be mediums. But when you are it, if you are that person who has that very rare and very special gift, you, you really, or I shouldn't talk about other people, I shouldn't say you, I should say me. For me, I hate the idea of people misusing the gift or being irresponsible with the gift. I hate the idea that they can get themselves into trouble if they don't know how to use the gift. I said to Chris this morning, you know, when the, when the student is ready, then the teacher will come. When I, as the, let's say, as the student, as the champagne bottle, when I was ready to pop, um, I couldn't possibly have done it on my own. I would have driven myself crazy. A lot of people drive themselves crazy. They think that they're having these weird experiences. They don't understand them. All of a sudden things go on in their head. They get confused about what they're seeing, what they're hearing and so on. I <clears throat> was fortunate and any natural medium, any medium who is meant to do this work will absolutely know when we are ready the teacher comes and for me those teachers came in the forms of Paul Denham and they came in the forms of Mick Maguire and I'll say again they did not teach me they helped me they guided me they uh, they took whatever was inside this champagne bottle they took it and they nurtured it and they helped me to nurture it and they helped me to understand it and so <clears throat> In the first, I'm going to say the first few months of my, actually, the champagne bottle popping open uh, and everything spilling out, in those first few months of experiencing this, I'm going to say perhaps even the first 18 months of experiencing all of this, many, many, many things happened. Uh, I had 
a trillion different experiences of uh, of the gift and and not just of the gift but how to use it and how to nurture it and how to keep it to make sure that it was kept precious to make sure that i didn't misuse or misunderstand or misinterpret and again i had my group around me so god didn't just say hey here you go rosemary off you go and here you are and now you're a medium and off you go and you can do it no i was put in an environment with people who could help me people who could guide me people who could steer me and and um, that you know that was the you know that that was the key i think to ensuring that i would always 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 be very aware of the responsibility of the gift it's an enormous responsibility why would anybody want it why would i want it if somebody had asked me beforehand and explained the responsibility that you what you do is you you touch people's uh, lives you touch people's hearts you change their lives you can change people's lives irrevocably and if you're not being responsible you can change those lives for the worst not for the best so you know being aware of the responsibility why would anybody want it why you know i i i get everybody wants we all want to talk to our loved ones in the spirit world that is not the same as mediumship that is not the same as being a medium and that is not that does not give you the ability to to um to counsel other people or to you know well i've got somebody here but i don't know who it is but they they're, but they're connected to you why would you do that why would you do that because if i'm going to say i've got somebody here i want to know who it is i'm speaking to i want to be able to see them i want to be able to have a conversation with them so all of these things were developed in these first few months in this first 18 months let's say <coughs> of my of my beginnings of working of working full-time and professionally as a spiritual medium and um during that time of course you know that i've mentioned paul denham and you know absolutely that i've mentioned mick mcguire but who have i not mentioned but who was there even before the cork popped open and the champagne fell out <coughs> should i say whooshed out and of course, it was Grey Eagle who always had his hand on my shoulder, has whole, always guided and steered me and always been able to, to, to explain to me when something is going on that I don't understand or if somebody in the spirit world is saying something to me that I don't necessarily get or quite understand, Grey Eagle is always there for me. We have to, I'm, I'm not an island. I don't do this on my own. I have those in the spirit world who help and steer and guide me, my daddy being one of them. Grey Eagle, of course, <coughs> being the main, let's say, the mainstay of what it is that I do. And Grey Eagle used to give me, or put me in a place where I would experience so, 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 so many things, uh, dealing with evil entities, dealing with negative forces, um, and one of those things that we used to have to deal with um, <clears throat> is, the, is rescue work. And very few mediums are capable of rescue work. Very few mediums even know what it means uh, to, to, to be involved in rescue work. But there are so many misconceptions also about what rescue work is and how it works and what we should or shouldn't do. <clears throat> Trance work is a very, very big part of rescue. Um, trance work is a very big part of a trans medium's life, and I am a trans medium. I don't nearly as often as I used to go into trance anymore. Perhaps it's because I'm older and I've got to conserve my energy. I'm not really sure. But <clears throat> going into trance is a, it's an interesting thing. And perhaps another time, uh, I'll tell you a story about uh, how we go into trance and, and in fact, the diff different stages of trance work that there are. And again, remember, okay, 
imagine that you're talking to a heart surgeon, but I'm not a heart surgeon, but I'm as rare as a heart surgeon. If I was a heart surgeon sitting at your dinner table, I would be describing all sorts of stuff that you wouldn't eat, you wouldn't know you wouldn't know what I was talking about, would you? Um, <clears throat> but a heart surgeon has all of this information, crucial information in order to operate successfully. They have all of this incredible information. And a medium has all of this incredible information in order to operate successfully as a spiritual medium. So when I'm talking to you, I might mention things that you think, I'm not quite sure what she means by that or whatever, but just visualize that I'm sort of like a heart surgeon in that I have all these intricate, this intricate knowledge and this intricate detail that uh, you only know through experience. I mean, I'm sure that a heart surgeon, the first time he picks up a scalpel and cuts in there and does his job, I'm sure he's terrified. When I was first doing this work, and when I was going into a trance state, of course, and when I was dealing with negative forces and so on, of course I was terrified. <laughs> you know, I didn't know necessarily what I was doing. I felt, though, that I had guidance as a heart surgeon will not be left with the scalpel all by himself. He's going to have his teacher, he's going to have his mentors, he's going to have people around him who are able to say, whoa, you know, you need to stop there or you need to, you know, go a little to the left or a little to the right. Mediumship is very, very much like that. So many different experiences that Greg will put me through and uh, <laughs> some of them were absolutely terrifying and uh, some of them were fascinating and interesting and, uh, and, and still fascinate me even today. Um, but one of the things that he uh, that wanted me to experience and which I'm so grateful for the experience is that we did uh, do some rescue work. Now, if you have read my book, The Eagle and the Rose, <clears throat> I tell a story in there about a little girl who, um, who uh, we, we did a rescue for. Oh boy, she was fantastic. She was an amazing little girl. She was beautiful. That, I'm not going to tell you that story today. Um, I'm going to tell you a story of, of what it's like to go into a trans state. It's, it's not really like falling asleep. It's like falling asleep except you are experiencing the things that are happening even if you might not be able to speak about them if you're in a deep trance state you often don't experience those things but if you're in a mild trance state or a medium state of trance you're able to see what's going on you're able to experience what's going on you're able to it's almost as if you're experiencing another life another another person's experience and going into trance and doing rescue rescue work is exactly that rescue work is when um and this is my story this morning rescue work is when uh you have someone in the spirit world brought to me by a great eagle and um I feel myself going into that trance state. And in going into a trance state means this is weird. You're going to think this is really weird. I thought it was very weird uh, in, initially. <clears throat> but it's literally as if you move out of your body. Now, I'm only going to talk about me now because other mediums have their own experiences. So as I'm going into a trance state, there is a shift. There is movement going on. You can feel it. It's a physical thing almost that you can feel, but it's when your, your etheric body, the spirit body that we all have, it's sort of, it's when it sort of shifts and moves and it's almost, it's almost if you find yourself, well, it is as if you, it is, you find yourself standing next to yourself, standing to the side. You are an onlooker. You are watching what's going on. Um, now, many people have had this experience of sort of being standing outside of themselves and seeing stuff going on. With rescue work, there's a slight difference. Move out, standing next 
to your body and then the person who is in trouble who needs help who needs rescuing let's say is allowed to move in so you move out and they move in now remember <clears throat> i'm not doing this by myself here great grail is right there and he's controlling things and he's controlling what's happening and he's already vetted the person who is allowed into my body who i'm actually allowing into my body because if you decide that you're going to do rescue work what you're basically saying is okay then you know i'll move out they can move in and this is when you have to the same with a heart surgeon this is when you have to totally trust your teacher you have to totally trust those people around you who are not only helping and guiding that person who needs rescuing but they are making absolutely sure that you are safe too and that's important you've got to make sure that there is this safety issue going on so you need people around you who know exactly what to do if for instance i panic what if i panic if for instance uh a bomb drops on the house if for instance some outside uh force comes along to disrupt what is going on so you need people around you people who know what to do if disruption occurs and they know how to keep you safe because going into a trance state can be tricky it can it's not an easy thing and you have to make sure that you prepare like the surgeon make sure that the patient has you know people around to you know with the anesthetic with everything that's prepared and needed the same thing applies although we don't use physical instruments but the same applies you have to have people around you who know what to do in certain circumstances so here this particular time we had this lady who <coughs> had died in a very difficult way a very traumatic way and she just couldn't seem to come to terms with what had happened to her which is why uh those in the spirit world had decided that she needed we use the term rescuing but why she needed rescuing from her own pain her own vulnerability she needed help to accept what had happened to her <coughs> so that she could then move forward so that she could then move on and what had happened to this particular lady was that she had been buried uh, as often happened years ago she'd been buried alive people hadn't obviously realized she wasn't deliberate uh, but you know sometimes people go into a, a deep coma or sometimes you know people have a i think they used to call it sleeping sickness where you can you know it 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 used to be very easy for people to mistake the fact that somebody was dead uh, anyway so this lady had been buried alive and she came to in her a coffin um and uh, tried her very best to get herself out of there now what happens with rescue work is when somebody dies in such a traumatic way they use the medium's body in this particular case my body and they then are able to reenact or to relive the exactly what's going on with them which is what this lady did and i standing to the side um and being in a trance state went through this whole process with her i felt the fear i felt the terror i looked as my hands were trying to rip open the coffin i was able to look at the the damage to her fingers because they were my fingers uh, i was able to look at the the blood and the, the the nails had been torn off i was able to go through that experience with her the horror of that with her 
uh, while she dealt with the fact that this is what had happened to her. And as she was reliving this, and as she was reliving the terror, not only was she doing that, but she also had grey eagle. She had her own loved ones in the spirit world. She, she had me, for, for whatever that was worth. She had people with her as she was going through it. And she had people with her, talking to her, uh, explaining to her what was happening, describing to her that it was okay, that she was going to come out of this. And also explaining to her that you can't, you can't change what happened, but now you've relived this and now you understand it better and now you're able to see that it happened to you in a physical sense, but here you are in a spiritual sense, you have your etheric body, you have survived this trauma, you have survived this awful thing that happened to you. And once we're able to explain that to people, and once I and my body, and even my mind to some extent, went through this with her, the terror of it with her, it was almost as if I was holding her hand every step of the way. And uh, afterwards, and after she had done this, we were able to talk to her and calmly, eventually, calmly and rationally help her to understand that that was not very good, that was not very nice, but it's, it, it's over now and it's time to move forward. And that is what rescue is about. Rescue work is about helping people who have gone through awful things and traumatic uh, uh, problems and difficulties, helping them to understand it, being with them that, so they're not alone uh, this time around, allowing them to go through the experience, allowing them to go through the feelings that they had, and also helping them to understand, okay, that, but it's, it happened, you can't change that, but now look what, now look what we have to look forward to. And this is what rescuing people is all about. You rescue them from their terror. You rescue them from the nightmare that they went through. You rescue them and help them to understand it. it's okay now. It's, it's okay. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid of anymore. Uh, and and uh, it's a very rewarding, it's very traumatic and an extremely exhausting process for the medium to go through because the medium is going through all of this and all of this emotion with the person who's using their body, their physical body. Which is why not too many uh, mediums choose to do rescue work. We, we, don't, we don't care for it too much because it can be, it, it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to see people going through pain and, and, uh, and, and the trauma of it. But it's also very rewarding because you can hold your hand at the end of it and say, okay, you're okay now. And you can see them moving forward. You can see them moving forward, accepting and smiling and embracing their new life. Now, as I'm talking to you all about this, there are, I, I said earlier on, I think, there are lots of misconceptions about um, rescue work. There are lots of misconceptions about when people need to be rescued. And I know that some of you are thinking, you know, maybe you had somebody you love who was killed in a car crash or an accident or, or what if somebody's murdered and what happens then and what if, what if, what if. Rescue work or those people who need rescuing are a little bit like that rare medium, a little bit like that rare heart surgeon extremely 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 rare it only happens in the most extreme circumstances most of most of us when we pass no matter how whether it's whether we are murdered or whether we are raped and murdered or whether we are you know whether in a car crash whatever it is we have our angels we have our loved ones in the spirit world who come to us and because we are um you know, we know our loved ones, and because we understand that our angels are there, even if we didn't believe in them before, now we do because we see them there, that is that is enough. So the amount of 
rescues is, well, less than rare. Um, if, um, if, if the percentage of heart surgeons in the world is less than 1%, I can tell you that the percentage of rescues or necessary rescue work is like point, 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 not, 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 whatever it is. I mean, it's so very rare. So I don't want any of you thinking, oh my goodness, you know, was anybody there for my loved one? Did anybody rescue my loved one? Because the answer is yes. For the majority of us, and even for the story I've told you about this lady, and even for all the rescue work that I've done, there were always our angels there, there was always our family there. But some people, very rarely, very rare, that some people are either either afraid to accept or don't want to accept that they died for whatever reason like the little girl i told you about she's i'm <laughs> oh well, my mummy i'm not you know not not i'm not going anywhere without my mummy so you know those circumstances are so 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 rare uh and um <coughs> rescue work in itself is so 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 rare uh that you know i can probably count on the fingers of both hands and maybe have a finger left over or something. In all of my years of experience as a medium, rescue work is one of those extremely rare things that we do. In this particular case, with this uh, lovely lady who had been buried alive, um, I'm pleased to report that as traumatic and exhausting and tiring as it was for me, boy, oh boy, did she ever come out of it really, really doing so, so well and has since then done so, so well. She just needed a little bit of expert help to help her through it. Don't we all of us need expert help from time to time? Yes, of course we do. So that, there you are, that is one of my very rare stories from a very rare experience oh and from a very rare medium the end <laughs> there you go chris <clears throat> wow rosemary that's that's a very powerful story and very uh visceral do you remember <clears throat> when you had finished with the rescue work how you were feeling oh yeah yes i think um you know, we talked about a champagne bottle and whoosh and everything goes up. But if you can imagine, uh, I don't know why this comes into my head, but if you can imagine a hot water bottle or a balloon or something that's filled, you know, with with uh, energy, let's say water, full of energy, and then there's, there's, you put a pinprick in it and it slowly, slowly, slowly starts to dribble away. And then there's, the, then there's nothing left of the balloon except this wrinkled up, piece of rubbery thing or the hot water bottle goes like that that's when you do rescue work it's it's so um let's say i'm going to say it is it's such a rare thing to do and it requires uh, a certain type of energy it requires a certain type of strength um but um talk about deflation <coughs> um uh, it requires it requires afterwards a good strong cup of tea i can tell you um so yes it is exhausting because you're having to i i think that nurses and doctors must see this with their patients you know patients who are battling patients who are fighting and you know they and uh, they're going through it with the patient aren't they if you've got a good nurse or a good doctor they're not just standing on the sidelines thinking oh yeah well that's their issue a good nurse or a good doctor is going through it with you holding your hand and helping you through it and uh, and they become exhausted which is why it's so important for us you know we talk about healing and giving healing and this is why you know our our future webinars are going to be, some of them are going to be about healing and what as healers we need to do. It's so important for us to give healing to our own selves and to, and to replenish the energy that we use. And so many people, whether they're doctors, nurses, carers, uh, people who, who take care of other people, why so many people get exhausted, they can't handle it any more or they you know they just become so worn out and often becoming sick themselves um this is why it you know it's important for them to to replenish their energy to give healing to themselves 
<coughs> well, I'm so. going to choose a comment um, that directly applies to what you just said, Rosemary. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is from Linda. Linda says, good morning. I work morning. for a doctor and our staff has been overwhelmed with all that's going on. Can you please send us some healing and comfort? It's starting to get emotionally and physically draining. Wishing all good health and stay safe. Well, Linda, uh, if you've, you've been listening to the story and you just heard what I said, it is so, 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 so important. I cannot stress it. Now, I stress it I, with my healers, with my students. Uh, I give them different exercises so that they can, you know, build their energy back up. Because every time you're giving energy out, and my darling, you work in, you work in, a, in, in this situation here, you, without even realizing, you're giving, giving, giving. You're giving your energy, you're spending your energy, you're giving out to people, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But a little bit like that balloon I talked about or that hot water bottle, you can only give out, you've only got so much. We have all of us, we've only got so much that we can give before we need to feed ourselves. So my darling, this is for you and for anybody else in that environment, anybody who is a carer, anybody who, I mean, you come on, if you're a carer, you know how exhausting <clears throat> the whole thing can be. So what you have to do, and you can do this as a group, or you can do it as an individual, you have to find a way to feed yourself. And it's important to feed yourself. Now, one way of feeding yourself is just... You know, taking a day, just go out for the day, do everything that you do in that day is for you. You please yourself. You, you, you lie in bed in the morning. You read a book. You do whatever it is that replenishes you. Um, there are also exercises. And if you go to our, uh, our YouTube channel, <coughs> you'll find exercise in there, healing exercises, where I describe using visualization techniques visualizing your aura visualize filling your aura with good bright stuff now my eight-year-old grandson can do this he's nine in next month but anyway still eight years old to me but he does this because i've taught him how to do this you can fill and create a fantastic and a beautiful aura give yourself healing every day visualize visualize the color blue Color blue is the universal healing color. Visualize the color green, peace and calm and tranquility. Um, when you when you wake up in the morning, uh, look in your look in your closet, look in your wardrobe, see what you can find that you can even if you can put on a pair of bright red knickers for all I care. Nobody else can see you, but you know you've got them on. Uh, but <laughs> blue and green is is also they're good colors. So wear a scarf or put on a sweater that's going to make you feel and, and remind you to visualize or help you to visualize, boy, oh boy, do I need energy? Do I need healing? Because the more you feed yourself, the more you will have for others. But if you don't feed yourself, if you're not paying attention to yourself, either by treating yourself sitting down at night, putting your feet up, watching a movie and just chilling out and not thinking about anyone or anything else. That's not an easy thing to do. But replenishing yourself, you've got to replenish your own energy. And as you replenish your energy, then your energy grows and builds and then you've got more for others. But I've seen it so many times, so, so, so many times. Doctors, nurses, carers of every description even if it's just that you're taking care of your mum or your dad you can you're a carer but anybody who's taking care of somebody else you have got to feed yourself you've got to replenish yourself otherwise i've seen it so many times i've seen fabulous wonderful healers who then become you know, crippled with arthritis. I'm thinking of one particular guy, couldn't walk, his feet were, because he forgot. He forgot about himself. He was so selfless. And the first rule, and you're going to think, and Linda, please pay attention. 
going to think that I'm an awful person when I say this. You cannot do a good job as a healer, as a carer, unless you know how to be selfish with yourself. And you've got to be rule number one, and I teach all of my students this, be selfish with yourself. Not to the point where you're walking all over everybody else. Not to the point where you're taking everything for yourself. But be selfish with yourself in that feeding yourself is the number one priority. If you want to do a really, really great job by taking care of others, you've got to feed yourself first. You've got to take care of yourself first. Otherwise, you'll be depleted, depleted, depleted until there's a point where you'll be useless to anybody and you'll find other people are taking care of you. Now, that works when you feed yourself. It works not only physically, but emotionally as well. And it's okay to cry and it's okay to become depressed from time to time. It's okay to become despondent. But when you feel that happening, you have, you know, you need feeding your soul, your spirit, your energy. You, you, the energy is becoming depleted. You've got to feed your soul. I hope, Linda, I hope that helps you. And you can feed it any way you like, selfishly. Chris. Well, Rosemary, you've worked with the medical community for all these years. Yes. And you're always available for consultations if groups or people want to get a hold of, of you, correct? Course. Of course. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I sat with, you know, I, one of my most amazing experiences, I, I've been to Johns Hopkins Hospital. I don't know if any of you know that Johns Hopkins is an amazing hospital. I've been invited there twice to speak. And um, I remember one of, one of those times I was so ill myself and boy, I got rave, rave reviews from, and the, and the audience of people were, they were themselves surgeons, doctors, uh, um, you know, not, not just uh, nurses uh, and um, also the administrative staff. Uh, but Johns Hopkins is an amazing hospital. It's a fan, fantastic children's hospital. And, um, you know, and so I was able to go there and say to them, okay, this is how you feed yourself. But go to my YouTube channel because you'll see in the healing sessions I teach people using visualization techniques how to feed themselves. So you please don't think I'm saying this to you and then not giving you the next stage. It's all very well. I say to you, okay, go go and make a chocolate cake. Well, what's the point in that if you don't know how to do it? So I'm saying to you, feed yourselves and go to the YouTube channel to find out how you do it. Chris. Well, I also remember when we were out in Western New York and the daughter of the woman who went under surgery without anesthesia. Oh yes. Oh my goodness. Told her story using your meditation tape. That's so true. Uh, yes, well, that's a, that's another story for another time. But yes, the woman had her, she literally had her hand removed. I mean, completely removed and then reattached. And because of her health and her situation, they did not want to put her under anesthetic. So she called me and she asked, could she use my uh, healing uh, CD? The uh, a journey towards healing, and they set it all up for her. The surgeon set it all up for her. They had the thing playing, replaying, and replaying. Uh, and, and she had a cassette. And she had her headphones on, and they replayed this this whole time. And literally, that entire the entire surgery, which took quite a while, because if you can imagine, you know, they literally had to take her hand off. Can you imagine this without anaesthetic? Take the hand off, turn it around because it did uh, anyway, and reattach the whole thing. And uh, that she used, uh, yes, she used a, the journey towards healing in order for her to do that. And we had so many comments from the the, the main surgeon was astounded because uh, the whole thing went so smoothly, much more smoothly than they had ever realize it could possibly go in such circumstances and um, <coughs> all of the team the surgeons and the 
and the uh, the you know the, the the nurses and doctors who were there during the course of that were they well they couldn't believe their eyes uh, uh, because um, this lovely woman uh, who, whose uh, daughter came to us afterwards and told us all about it. Uh, this lovely woman went through this entire surgery. Uh, can you believe this with no pain? Can you believe that she went through all of this and came out the other side? What a rescue that was. Anyway, Chris, keep going. All right, we're coming. We're coming up to time, so I'm going to do a couple more questions. Um, Jillian said, "I was listening to a recent stream where you talked about auras. Yes, can the average person elevate their awareness to see this energy? Yes, or do you need to be born with the ability? No. Um, I mean, you know, well, my grandson probably is born with this ability, but no, I." I encourage all of my students to, we call it aura spotting. It's such a lot of fun to do. And anyone can do it with a little bit of patience. And you, don't, you might not necessarily see colors, but you might, you might just see it in the form of shadows. Or <coughs> you can feel it. Uh, remember the, 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 um, the song that was sung to me many years ago, Listen With Your Eyes. It's the rainbow song, red and yellow and pink and green, orange and purple and blue. You can see a rainbow. You can see a rainbow too. And the rainbow is the rainbow of colors that is, you know, that is uh, the, uh, the energy in, in the universe that we can tap into. And it's part of our, or a part of our energy field. Uh, you might see it. Uh, in a way that you don't necessarily use your eyes, but you can use it to see in another way, or you might just feel the colors, or you might feel that vibration. People see in different ways, but yes, uh, go for it. What I'm going to suggest you do, if you want to sort of try this, is uh, you know, um, so start with the start with those things that perhaps are not so uh, difficult. Um, a woodlouse is the first time I ever saw, ever saw an aura was on a woodlouse. Spiders have a fantastic, pure, beautiful, clear, can't believe it, can you? But yeah, beautiful, beautiful energy field. They have auras. Every living thing has an aura, an energy field, even leaves and trees. So, you know, don't just limit your uh, aura spotting to humans. Uh, you know, animals, you can see animals, dogs, whatever. Their aura shines so brightly, so clearly sometimes that we can see them more easily. So let us know how you do, my lovely. Chris. All right. And then uh, <coughs> Carla has a question. Um, what is your opinion of oracle and tarot cards, water scrying, dousing? I recently discovered you in your books and you're answering so many questions for me. I will continue learning from you in Great Eagle, and thank you. Oh, good. Thank you for that. Um, you know, you, you need the book, You Own the Power, because that answers a lot of questions. But I have many times taught my uh, students uh, dowsing. There's a fantastic story in one of my books about a man in, uh, in Crete, uh, lived in Crete, John Michelides, who was a professional dowser, Absolutely. I believe in all of that stuff. Um, uh, I think energy, you know, we can find it in many different places. I think the tarot is an amazing <clears throat> thing. Here's the, here's the thing with tarot, the tarot cards. If you get someone who's using them, who doesn't, doesn't know how to use them, forget it. It's the same with anything, isn't it? Uh, it's all very well having the tools, but if you don't know how to use them, <laughs> Forget it. It's not going to work. Uh, runes is another. I love the runes. Um, and if you've got a set of runes, do not allow anybody else to touch them. That's most important because you don't want other people's energy, uh, you know, getting in the way of that. The same with tarot cards as well. But if you have people who know how to use these things and they use them sensibly and they know they really are knowledgeable knowledgeable about how to use them they work but if you're just that person who goes into a bookstore oh i'll get it 
you know, pack of tarot cards and you're just doing it and you're just playing around with it, that's when it gets silly and that's when it can get dangerous. So please, 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 with all of these things, please be cautious and please be careful. Anybody can douse. We did experiments, I'll tell you that story maybe next Saturday. We did a fantastic experiment with pendulums and my students and um, you know, obviously some people are better able to do it than others, but <coughs> excuse me, but we can all do it. Pendulums are fantastic. I get my students to get their pendulums. In fact, Chris, maybe you'll tell a story one day about how you found your glasses, uh, having heard from your husband to use your pendulum. That would be a great story to tell, right? It was amazing. So, uh, all right. Uh, Do you have time for one last question? Sure. All right. D is asking, I did. Can, can you tell us exactly what you did to recuperate your energy after doing a spiritual rescue? Uh, well, yes. I'll tell you exactly what I did. Uh, well, first of all, I had a cup of tea and sat with my, with my group because my group there was not by myself, remember, you don't can't do these things by yourself. You have to have people who are, help you and so on. And they were able to fill me in on some of the parts that I uh, didn't necessarily see. Uh, and we talked about it. And then, you know, obviously, even though you're physically exhausted when you do these things, you're physically exhausted. Uh, but emotionally, you... Yeah, yes, you're exhausted, but you're also on a high because what, what, what did I just witness? You know, this amazing thing that happened that you witnessed. So, so usually after these things, I'm awake for a lot of the night. I don't go to sleep because things going on in my head. But at some point, I will find the time to say, okay, now enough of all of that stuff. I have to replenish. What I do when I replenish, I use, use visualization techniques. I sit with my hands, palms up, look at videos on YouTube. I know it works because I do it myself. And I visualize the color blue and I visualize the color green and I visualize the color gold also, which is an important color for me. And I visualize all of this fantastic energy swirling around me. And then I breathe in using my solar plexus and I absorb and fill myself up with this incredible energy. I mean, I literally gobble it up. I sort of, I'm like a sponge soaking in all of this phenomenal, incredible energy that is going to help me to replenish and to feed my soul. So that's what I do. Chris. All right. So Rosemary, you've, <laughs> you've gone over time. Did did you want to end now? Or are you willing to go further? Well, you're in charge, Chris. I, I, I love you, So all we, these people that are looking for a message that their loved one has passed and they we want. Actually, no, we actually, we both know that we're not in charge. We know that Well, um, we, we can do a couple more. Uh, but unfortunately, we do not have time to give messages to anyone. Yeah, I... I'm really thinking, folks, if you want to make sure to share this video um, and have it go wide, it's going to benefit a whole lot of people. So that would be really nice if you'd help us out. Um, Karen's saying uh, burnout right now is extremely important to grasp at this point in time, I think especially so. in the healthcare field. I, I really do think so, because and, and it's not just in the healthcare field, although, you know, um carers are so important and i think that, that you know we're so busy dealing with the patient very often we forget the carers and the, and dealing with the carers and helping the carers is so 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 important but i think that it's for all of us right now uh <clears throat> i have to tell you that i found it extremely frustrating here in new york because it's it's all that it seems to be on everybody's mind is what is going on in the world and um there are so many wonderful things going on in the world also. There are so many beautiful things going on in the world. And I think that we have to focus on not just the, the awful things, because no doubt there are awful things going on, but I think we also have to remember to focus on the good stuff as well. 
Well, there's a saying that I ran into recently, um, was reminded of recently, life happens for us, not to us. Uh, it, it really does because, and I've, we've said this before, Chris, out of the worst of circumstances, if we really look hard, and sometimes it does take a, a lot of courage, and a lot of energy to look hard, but we can always find the good in any situation. And I think, <clears throat> because my coffee is getting worse, my talking too much, I think, and my poor family are they're in, uh, hidden in another room in them. I'm sure they want <laughs> trying to, to be quiet. Yeah, they're, they're trying their very best. So I'm going to say thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to say thank you for everything that you do. And of course, to Gregor, uh, we always would say thank you because without him, we couldn't be doing this anyway. And thank you to everybody, all of you out there who watch uh, us so regularly, who give us your support. We love, 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 love you. We love having you. We love having your questions. We love hearing your your stories too. <coughs> excuse me, excuse my coughing. We just love, love, love having you. So uh, next Thursday, we will be doing this again, I think, unless I'm on a plane, but we'll let you know. And um, <coughs> I'm hoping that by this time next week, perhaps I'll be in Florida. Uh, yes, I'm going home this week. It's sort of, it's a, I want to go home but I don't want to leave, and you know, that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, in the meantime, until I see you again, uh, go to my website for all of the stuff that we, we're up to, rosemary at rosemaryaltair.com. Or, uh, no, actually, the website is rosemaryaltair.com. I think that's all you need to write in there. You'll see all sorts of things going on there. And um, in the meantime, until I see you again, please, please, please have a very, very blessed rest of the day and have a very blessed weekend everybody bye bye